me from the last couple weeks in the studio. They already know that because I've been waxing on and on about Mr. Michael Sherrill's coming. You have to come check him out. So um, I'm very excited to have him here. He's uh, in collections across the country from uh, the Smithsonian all the way over to the LA County Art Museum. And I had the privilege of seeing him demonstrate very early on in my career, almost 20 years ago. And his voice still resonates in the studio with me at times. So I am so happy that you're here to hear his lecture. So no more of me. And let's have Michael Sherrill come up and hear. Well, it's good to be here tonight. Thanks for making, uh, you guys, I don't know how you live with this traffic. <laughs> no, I don't. I mean, I, I live in Bat Cave, North Carolina, and and I could lay down in the middle of the roads certain times of the day, and nothing would hit me. So, um, uh, it's you know I've been doing what I do for since I was about 16 years old, and uh, I fell in love with clay and just wanted to figure out how in the world I could make a living doing what I like to do and what I was passionate about doing. And I can remember the, this, this is uh, my mountains where I live, and I, I, there's a great um, uh, early American painting of, uh, you know, I'm trying to remember the painter's name, but you basically standing out on the precipice looking at this vast land, and you'll never be able to explore it. It's so vast, you'll never. And still, I mean, I've driven across this country enough times, and, and I'm going, I've just seen one little line of a road or a weaving line usually, because I'm going all over the place. This is a, you know, a, a, a vast landscape. And clay has been that for me. It's been one of those things where you, you get started and, and it, it takes you on an adventure and I don't feel like uh, in this lifetime there's enough hours for me to exhaust even just a, a narrow road through, through clay and through making. And I mean, my life has moved from, from um, you know, just working in clay to working in other materials, but clay has always been my my first thing, my first love, my first uh, material. And um, I was spending a little time with some Otis students, and I said, you know, the thing is, a lot. I asked how many people, you know, spending time drawing, and uh, how many how many people really manipulated material. And I said, well, if you're three dimensional, clay's your clay's your way to sketch, to realize, to think. The same way you'd use a, a, you know, a pencil on a piece of paper, and um, so I think it's a valuable tool, and I'm, and I'm, I like to proselytize about the fact that that we need to be touching things in this society. We need to be connecting kids to real stuff as well as the digital world, because it's there's a new world on that. It's here. It's already all around us, and I'm hoping that that we don't lose that ability to work with our hands and do the things we do and gain information there and then create a new world that this digital world is allowing us to think in quite different ways. It's pretty amazing. Um, and I'm, I'm a guy who loves um, material. This is just a little shot of a little cup. Um, and, and I'm playing around with a lot of different things. I started out in salt glaze and, and uh, high fire a little bit even in high school. Um, I've traveled a little bit, and um, a few years ago we were in Florence, and uh, we happened upon going to the Duomo, and going up on the, the dome, um, working our way up that structure, and um, here's what I found at the top. This is a piece of wrought iron that was probably, wrought iron's not made very much today. Steel is, wrought iron's not. Wrought iron's uh, made by a blacksmith who forms iron ingots and then pals them together. And so they form sort of uh, a little bit like grains of wood, but when it's, when it's not weathered like this, it looks just like uh, it's smooth. You know, it's, it was probably finished very smooth. But it's the human and the weather and time and the process that reveals the beauty of that little piece of metal. And to me, it, it speaks about um, you know the humans that have touched it and the humans that made it, but it's also talking about the material world that we live in and work with in our lives. And I would like to think that somehow there's a way to, to make people value material rather than 
make it everything around us disposable. So that's, I mean, and I, maybe that's a, a, a lofty idea, but to make people, I mean, there's a few things in probably all of our lives that we treasure because they have meaning because a human, or your mother gave them to you, or your father gave them to you, or, your, or something that has some kind of meaning somewhere along the way. And we had, we're, we're human beings that we attach things like that, and, and everything can't have that value, but that can set the tone for the, the way we look at this earth and the way we live. This is my dad. This is, uh, he's born 1908, and uh, I said the other day he was known as a wild ass um, in the South. That's what you call anybody that just does what he wants to do. But he raced motorcycles, he invented stuff, and he, did, and he, he worked on processes. Um, his real, most of his patents were in the oil uh, filter business. And the Coke can uh, the, with no seam on the bottom was attributed to his patent uh, further down the road. But this is after he won the Daytona for 24 hours. Mm -hmm. uh, and my brother Bix, my brother Bix is uh, uh, seven years older than I, six or seven years older than I, and he's, he's passed away now. But but he was just the most creative soul, one of the most creative souls that I knew as a kid. He was, he opened this world about making and creating in a way that was, uh, I wanted to be like him. I mean, I, I, I mean, I was, you know, 60s and 70s and everything was pretty conventional. And my stepfather, you know, he wanted me to be a practical kind of guy and go get a regular job and you know, get a regular ed education. And, and I just said, you know, I love, I want to be a maker, and I don't know how to do it, but I want to be a maker. And I live in North Carolina where it's pretty pretty fortunate that there's, uh, you know, I, I used to get in the car and just ride down from high school and go visit a uh, fourth generation potter, and that's pretty rare. These are the two women that gave me some sense of uh, social responsibility, kept me from, from uh, being a wild ass myself, maybe. And, <laughs> and, uh, um, my grandmother and my mom, um, whom, whom have really, uh, you know, were generous spirits, both of them. And my mom's sort of Rosie the Riveter side of that, and uh, my grandmother just was the biggest uh, comfort for an entire family. She cut a big wake. And my grandfather, who, who um, was from northern Georgia, uh, sort of in the hill country, uh, made whiskey, farmed, uh, worked in textile mills. And he's the guy that is responsible for a lot of my passion about the natural world because he, he would show me material or trees and say we would make these things on the farm out of this hickory and this ash we would use for that. So he really showed me that the natural world was a place of resources for, for he, his family when he grew up, and um, and it and it keyed into being a maker, you know, because you look at the things around you and realize that that you don't have to go to the store to buy something. Sometimes it's you walk in the woods and you find it that way. So this is me as a young man throwing pots. I did salt glaze, as I said, and uh, hippy dippy man. <laughs> there's a hippy dippy teapot. So this is 1974 or five, something like that. I was in that shot, I was probably 22, 23 years old. And I made this kind of stuff and sold it through uh, craft stores. I moved to the mountains of North Carolina because the Southern Highlands Handicraft Guild would buy pots in the wintertime. And at that time, they had, it, there's another guild in, I believe, New Hampshire that's almost, they argue about who's the oldest in the country. And, and so they would, being a member there, I thought I could make a living, so that was a, I aspired to that gold, and I, I did did become a member, and uh, I would eat mostly in the winter. I did okay. <laughs> um, but but this is the kind of practical, simple things, and and I must say that you know Penland has an incredible influence on on me as a person because the people like Cynthia Bringo were serial uh, production potters. They weren't they weren't making the same object one the same thing every time. Cynthia is the perfect example of someone who would play as she made, and she would do an experiment as she made 
lots of teapots or lots of mugs or lots of practical stuff, but she would play. And so I think that came into my work, but I've always spent a little more time on my work uh, than, than I could afford to sell it for. So it sort of took me on a journey of trying to figure out how to do this. And it was always that next opportunity that if I could get into a better show, I remember when I got into the Frederick Craft Show up in Maryland, and that was a big deal for me, and, and went up there and, and had a really great show. And after years of doing this, it's like you get to do the best thing you can do. If you can do better, you do better. So it, it, when I started doing Smithsonian and the Philadelphia Women's Show, I realized, and it's not with this work, but with other work, I realized that the people who were buying my pots were the people that were real collectors. And so it, it, that was an education for me. Everything kind of peeled back like an onion. I, I needed to, I was not aware of everything I needed to know, but as it came along, I sort of picked up the tools that I needed to survive. So this, there's a whole mess of work that's between those pots that you have not seen, and, and I could reinvent myself quite easily. And um, this goes back about 25, 26 years ago and very Bob Sperry, but that's, uh, this is um, not Bob Sperry's glaze, but it's sort of a, uh, something close to it. And so I was, I was teaching at Penland at the time, and uh, so these, these very kind of usable things came about um, at that time while I was teaching. And uh, just to give you a sense of the, the and I live, you know, like I said, in North Carolina, and there's English potters and German potters, and um, um, you know, the first Americans before they called it America. They, they made pots and I, I grew up in a little place where there were shards, uh, Indian pot shards all around where I grew up. And I just walk out and play in the field and pick up shards. And, and so these are really a little, this series of bottles I did over, you know, a good many years. And they're the homage really to, to North Carolina pots and uh, playful, a little more contemporary. And, but I did these groupings and settings, and, and they, you know, there's, there's a set of these at the High Museum in Atlanta. Um, but, and I love to throw. I mean, I could throw as well as anyone I know. And, but it defined the work to a certain degree. And um, as my experience with sort of going out is, so what, I, I'm skillful, so what, I can do these things. I just started to ask more questions about, um, how to connect with people visually rather than just being the practical uh, mug that I still love. I mean, we have mugs coming. We have so little space in our house when it comes to a place to put another mug. My wife could probably tell you that don't come home with another mug and I come in with three or four. And, and so I love real pots, so don't, don't mistake what I'm saying. But when I, when I started realizing that, that I I like that thing of dealing with the aesthetics of things just as much as the practical side. That's when my work really started to change into something different. But this little shot just goes, to, this is my old studio, um, which, you know, I work and I have to clean up between different disciplines, but this is in here because I can tell you that that's when I started using the extruder in odd ways. So these things are thrown and altered and, and I'm kind of putting these things together uh, and, and I, I kind of tint them for a while and then come back and come apart and stick them back together to make things like this. So, um, so then just, and this is a pretty, and, and the proportions are large and, and I was interested in stripping things down. I had a great friend, Sid Oakley, who was older than I was and he would always kind of speak to me. He said, Michael, you had a great sense of form and, and, and at the time, I was putting all this kind of doodads on and stuff. And he said, why do you, why do you put all that crap on your pots for? <laughs> and and uh, so it just made me think. I walked away. It was one of those stellar moments for me because it made me go, OK, I need to find out what, what little I can do to make it really a great object. So this work was part of that series of work. And all these are pretty big. They're not small. I'm only in that range. Okay. Uh, anywhere from. Uh, 21 to 32 inches tall, depending on what it is. And this one's uh, it was at Mad. I think it's still there permanently. Mm -hmm. and, uh, this is also big, big platter, mm -hmm. big charger. And this is a smaller piece. What is it? What is it? T. Uh, 
<laughs> so here's what happened was I was like many of us clay artists who were at the right place at the right time thanks to Sonny and Glory Kim and a few other collectors like them you know the teapot movement was really big and so this allowed me to make work that had greater value and it, it started to be about aesthetics and about uh, a different different thing and and it, it gave me the freedom to be for instance at sofa for gosh i don't know about 10 years uh, so sofa new york and chicago and that's where i really realized too that i could be i could really push the limits because i saw people and i saw glass and wood and everything else and different values that i just went i just need to try to do my best so this work is uh a uh, combination of thrown and altered and extruded pieces. <laughs> this is all all the components, and so this came out of the extruder. It's called Florida Lee, and actually that is Sunny and Glory on that piece. This is my studio. I have about 5,000 square feet of uh, studio space, and um, it's I've worked for gosh, about seven or eight years very quietly until mud tool, tools came along and now it's pretty much a beehive of a place. But um, here's my big door. My, I have a door at one end of the studio, 16 by 16. And the best light in the whole place is right there. Bears come charging out of those woods? Yeah, well, they cross the property. Turkeys, bear, coyotes. We see They're more out here too, so watch out. Okay. Well, actually, we we're my wife and I are walkers, and we were walking on one trail here, and it had a warning about about be careful of wild animals. So, here's a shot of the studio. Um, it's much clutter. It has more clutter now than this. Um, this little piece is called Henry's Bow for Henri Matisse. Um, it's cutouts, and the cutouts had a big effect on me. I saw them in my early twenties, and they kind of provoked. Uh, me to think about that flat work that he did on his back with a pair of scissors and um, and I, I didn't really completely understood it but it kind of shook me a little bit so it, 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 it worked its way into my the dimensional thing of flattening for me and planes to a certain point this piece is um, called Tango Leaf, and it's not a peapot or anything, it's just an object. And then I did, I redid it in Cone 6 Porcelain, and that's, and it's almost like I threw a switch. I just didn't look back when I came back to porcelain again. And it had a profound effect on my thinking and what I was doing. Um, I mean, one of the things that happens for a lot of us is, it's it within maybe a lot of us artists to do quantum leaves and to do them often. And um, and I could do that. I could recreate myself at a drop of a hat. But I realized that it was doing my career a disservice because I would, I would gain these people who like my work and then I wouldn't care about them and I'd go do something different. And so I'd leave them kind of in the dust going, where is he going? What's he up to? But it's about this time that I realized that I really could move forward and I also could work out from an idea. And, and as an artist, it's, I guess it's gaining a little bit of maturity uh, that, that helped me to sort of realize I could do that. So these are folded kind of uh, constructions. They actually kind of suck the air out of them to cause them to fold or they're, they're, they have volume and you kind of pull the air out and they shrink up. Little bottles are carved. And at this point, I start layering uh, on go uh, on top of layer upon layer, and then I'll work back through that before they get their final firing. And so it just has a developed surface. You know, there's a richness to the, to the surface that I like. And, uh, and also the, the chance to do a really diverse kind of glaze technique that gives me, like this has black and red and, you know, blues and purples. And, and the technique is not like I have to stop it. Um, so the, it's all done in an ungo, and then a clear glaze goes over it. So um, it, it's it's pretty liberating, actually. And then the metal came in because I wanted to make bigger things, and porcelain, as we all know, kind of moves around a lot. 
and to make really big things out of porcelain, you, you, you're always pushing that, that um, technical edge of, of how things can be constructed. And if, if you hadn't gained it from the work already, I like lime. So metal came in to create lime, and the clay came as a component for color. And, uh, and there's this conversation that's gone back and forth of, between them, and I'd like to think that there's a marriage between those two materials that, at least in my work, it works. Uh, the, the, this piece is uh, Shining Rock Rotor Dinner. This is uh, part of the Smithsonian collection. So my wife, Marjorie, was pregnant when I was doing these. These are Buckeyes. It's called Love in the Shade. They're, this time of year, the, all the Buckeyes are letting go of their, their fruit. Bumbleberry, this has a steel core in it, for those of you who do practical thinking about it. So that's what makes that work. That's, and it's about, I don't think about nine feet long, close to it. And that's probably about 11 feet long because it's in a knot, it's, um, it doesn't seem that big. Corona Spinora. And this, this piece is called Undressed. And uh, this is a, I mean, I was working, you know, the, sort of the clean work and then I get in my new studio and I'm, I'm looking at the natural world every day when I'm out there and I'm walking around and I start having a conversation and I never thought I would be making this natural narrative kind of work. And it was not, I was at a time when really it felt like it was the right thing to do, but, but uh, you know, the, the art side of me you know, postmodernism was going on, and you could kind of do what you wanted to, to a certain degree, and it just crept back in. But I think a lot of this is informed by me stripping things down when I was making the really simple work. So I've tried not to add too much to this. It's just what it needs to be. I'm not overdoing it. So at this point, I'm working in steel, and I'm carving the steel, uh, you know, some forging, mostly fabrication. And in my shop, I, I had the ability to, to forge, fabricate, and uh, uh, cast if I want to cast. I can do that at this point. Uh, this little piece, uh, this little apple piece. These are, these are my neighbors, Alma and Oscar Avery. And a large reason why we live where we live is because the ladies that own the place where we now live um, wanted to make sure that we were going to be good neighbors to these guys. And, um, and the great, this gift for me and my wife Marjorie who's in the other room, and, and my three younger kids is to grow up with uh, Alma and Avery because they've lived simply uh, subsistence farmers, generous. Uh, if there's a piece of ground, watch out, I'll uh, plant something in it. <laughs> Even if it's on your land. <laughs> and, 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 and I just, just a, a, you know, I helped him start his tractors. He helped me do whatever I needed to do. And he's, he's been gone about four years now. So they're, they're important. And so I've done a few pieces, that piece early on. This, this is a, a portrait that my son, Micah, uh, who's uh, 38, did of Alma. And there's one of that. Mm -hmm. And this is wood, um, found objects, and, and acrylic, and then uh, and painting in acrylic. Um, and this is a, a piece that sort of in, in, I sort of trimmed these trees the old way, and they were beautiful. In fact, when he stopped trimming the trees, the trees got ugly as they, they could be. And I'd walk through the trees, and you realize that, that the role of someone who cares for something, and how when they stop being able to care for it, how it changes things. And uh, so it's a pretty powerful thing for me. This is uh, uh, called Alma's Weed, <laughs> and that's her. She's she's something else. <laughs> so it comes to tools. Um, I've always been a tool maker. I, I come by a little honestly. My father, being an inventor, he just lived the life that he did. He made stuff, made machinery. Um, I love telling the story. I, I tell them often. Is when my sister and I would be in our house and making a lot of racket. We were both small. And my mother would, would shush us and say, you got to be quiet, your dad's having a brainstorm. And he'd be sitting at the table, 
he'd be sitting at the table with his hands on the table just doing this. And he'd be thinking of, through something and trying to figure something out. I never saw him make a drawing. I never saw him, but I, he'd build machines that could fill an entire room like this. And, um, and, uh, and that was, you know, it's probably in the DNA. I don't know what it is. And uh, I haven't said it yet, but I mean, I struggled in school with dyslexic, so I, I, I kind of have created my own path as a result of that. But, but I've always been someone who loves material and, and, and altered tools. I mean, the clay tools that I got were good, but they were, weren't great. And I always made my own and, or made additions or changed them or did something. I mean, I, had a, I have a little box of precious things that I've worked on that I think are pretty personal to me, but I probably have them three or four times that much that were experiments that did not work out. But every once in a while, I've come up with things that are, have been pretty important. And that's how I stumbled into to being involved with a company, Mud Tools, that I created about, at this point, about 18 years ago. I think it kind of got going. And so here's Mud Tools and all the tools that we make. and. I, I, it's making tools very much like making art. In my opinion is trying to do your best and and really bring uh, a functional thing that really works and performs, but also aesthetically is pleasing. Um, and you know, I changed the pottery work tables of the country with these color grips. Before they were black and maybe blue and a bunch of wood. <laughs> so. Uh, I made I made the clay world garish, so I'm proud of that. <laughs> so here's me kind of doing my thing with a couple of tools. I mean, for instance, that's a Japanese style um, carving tool, but I've kind of turned it on its ear, so it's like the Japanese style, but I've just kind of made it different than that. So it does different things as a result. And um, a big project I did for Bank of America, um, it was a chance to really do something large. This is about 26 foot tall. I built it in my studio. My friend Hoss Haley came, he was setting his studio up and he and I worked together on the fabrication of the armature together. And the piece goes up. And the funny thing is, right down the street, if I go to that street and look up, the only old building left is my father's old machine shop. It's, crazy. it's downtown Charlotte, so it's, most everything's new. <laughs> not, not, not at all. But um, this is uh, called Temple of the Cool Beauty. It's about four and a half feet tall. It's bronze, glass, and I do flame working glass. And I do big glass, but I do it with gaffer, so I'm not, I'm not skilled enough to keep up with those guys. And I do, uh, the past six or seven years, my, my career has sort of changed a little bit. It was I was doing SOFA almost all the time. And these chances to do larger projects came about. And uh, this is um, it, the Billmore family called the Cecils. I did this for Jack Cecil for a project that he had going. And it's called Beauty in a Hard Place. That stone came off of um, Frederick Olmsted, uh, and almost every park creates this part, well, at least four things of his projects I'm aware of. Uh, a place called the Ramble inside of it. In Montreal, there's a Ramble, and Central Park is a Ramble. And when they, he designed the grounds at the Biltmore House, he created the Ramble, and that's where this, this piece is from. And, and these excavate this stone came out of the excavations. Of the ramble. And I, and I always like to talk about the the how grateful I am to the institutions that open up residency programs. I've been, I've been fortunate enough to do a few. And uh, this is the slag heap at Kohler in Wisconsin. Kohler makes uh, you know, toilets and sinks and showers and um, engines for lawnmowers and all kind of stuff. And um, I went to Kohler to work in iron. Um, I had um, 
you know, just a blast of a time. The hard thing was just being away from family for that three month period that I was gone. This is the largest thing that they still hand pack. Um, the, they make the mold, but it's it's bond, bonded sand is the generic word, and uh, they're poured uh, very traditionally. Uh, but they have automated lines there. They do all kind of crazy stuff. But when you go there, you have to figure out that you're working inside of a system, and and you got to figure out as an artist how to exploit that system to make it work for you and to work with the people on the floor who are capable of helping you. So it's a really, it's it's wonderful in the fact that you go in, you have to adjust it, you have to work inside that system. So it, it creates some limitations, but you can do some cool stuff with it. This is my bowl set for one of the projects I did, which were these kind of bomb looking things. But, you know, I work all day and build, build these three moles, for instance, and and if I stayed up a little later, they would pour them for me at about 1 o'clock at night. And then I had to wait another hour to roll them out of the cooling yard. And uh, it was just a, a vicious circle. And then I'd come back in the next morning at 8 o'clock and do pattern making all day long until I could get back to make a few more of these. So it was just around the clock. But you just move them right up to the, the iron pouring line and they'll just top them right off. It's pretty amazing. And, uh, and they're very generous, uh, the Arts and Industry Program. And if you're ever in uh, Wisconsin, please make time to go to the, through their uh, collection and, and also to the Core Arts Museum, which is pretty fabulous. There's a little bit more of this kind of stuff I was doing. Uh, these, are, these are being enameled inside of the enamel ovens. And they shake the enamel on, just like powdered sugar and you watch it melt, the glass melt. Mm -hmm. So these are these are about seven and a half feet tall. So here I'm back to being more minimal with this work. And that's the secret reason I went to Wisconsin. <laughs> I actually I actually begged to go in the salmon run. <laughs> so can I come in the fall when the salmon are running? I had a bicycle that I paid three dollars and fifty cents for and I could drive from the artist house down to where the salmon run kind of terminated. Oh my god. And there was one because we could t you know they you, you could take them you should take them actually and uh, I once went back with two of them on my handlebars and the tails were dragging the ground. <laughs> oh I took them to the smoker and send the, send the smoked fish back home. But uh, Chicago here, I did a, a project for Rachel Kohler, who's Ruth Kohler's uh, niece uh, in her home in Chicago. Uh, kind of a big wall piece. Are the white flowers glass? They're glass, yeah. And they're sandblasted just like the clay. The clay, what I've done is uh, the colors are brighter if you, if you don't use a, a, a an opacifier or tin or anything else inside of glazes, it kind of fights with some of the color. So I do it with a glaze that's really quite bright and then I just sandblast and frost it and then we polish them. So and it, my life is an amalgam of borrowing from the glass world and using what I can use there or, or clay world and kind of mashing it together to make a system that works for me. It's one of my favorite rhododendrons here. It's a little more recent, but there, um, this this gives you an idea of um, the finished piece. But then you can kind of go in and see the naked piece. And I love to have this in here for students so they can kind of see the thinking. Is that glass there? That's glass, and that's just sitting there. It's kind of stuck on just for that little shot. It's not even uh, so. Everything is um, attached with a post. You know, sort of like a post and a receiver, and uh, I use uh, mostly uh, like a PC7 kind of glue. But you can see that's the piece naked. Naked. Um, uh, the colored clay starts to become a really big part of what I'm doing. I was playing around with colored clay. Actually, the first time I gave myself the permission to, to work with the extruder and color clay was at Watershed, which Beth Ann is on the board of. And uh, it was my 
week or two weeks to kind of say, I'm just going to do something that's completely not commercial, just kind of see what would happen. And, and it's, it's really uh, changed my world, it's rocked my world. Um, and these are the beginnings of, of sort of that process. Um, these are layers of color. In fact, those of you who are going to come on Saturday and you see this big Dagwood sandwich that I've worked on in there with color and layered clay stacked up in strata like that. When it goes through the, the extruder, it folds it into itself. So it creates these really beautiful uh, uh, different structures. It's complicated but to explain. But then you reveal the color through carving on this one. With so, a and they're sandblasted. Well, on these, they're polished. They're, you don't, I'm not putting any glaze on the outer pieces. They're just polished with, and I use a industrial scotch brite, which has a, a little bit of oxide. And it's just the sweetest small, small pieces I did, about seven or eight little small pieces. It's called uh, Blue Moderne. Um, and this is uh, called Jules Vernium, made up word, and uh, made up plant. Um, it's a pretty big piece. Um, this piece went uh, called Mouse to Feed, went to the Corning Museum, which I'm very proud of. I snuck in the glass museum. <laughs> so the little blooms are glass and bronze and clay. And another piece that's a little bit like the, the one before the last one. But these are snakes that I did in Tacoma at the glass museum. And with some great gaffers, or I've never been able to do it. Little magnolia. Uh, my armatures vary in the kind of way I treat them, but I have this passion for that Egyptian looking bronze that I've seen my entire life going to museums, so I use black a lot. So this project uh, was a, about a, a year in the making, uh, six months in the execution. And the thoughts behind it, this is my friend Adver Singer in Israel doing a paper kiln. Looks like he's praying at the waiting wall. And, um, uh, but this piece is uh, in, a, in a hospital that's called the Plain Tree Hospital. And their whole thing is not having a hospital that's like a normal hospital. They want it to be warmer. They want it to include family. They want it to include art. And so this is, and this is their signature piece that I did for them. And so some of this was cast in bronze. We did that in the studio. Go through these pretty quick. Power hammer, beating stuff out. Bronze, you don't get it red hot. You can get it hot to where it's just barely enough color in it to stretch it out. Because it's almost all copper. By the time you get it uh, hot like an iron bar, it would be, it would just fall apart. Here we are pouring some of the components, digging it all together. It is in the studio. Probably about this time, whenever that was, so many years ago. Clay uh, components, the canopy. I like that canopy shot a lot. And then there's the finished piece. Love it. 11 foot in diameter, 11 and a half feet tall. So I did a project for some folks in Seattle, and they were very patient because it took me a long time to pull all this off. And this, this gives you an idea of the process of me kind of working through an idea, because I'm really bad about having an idea that requires some research and some sort of development of something. Instead of just going with what I could go with and, and get it done, I felt like and this pushed me to, to, to go, um, to change a little bit. And um, so the, here I'm drawing to communicate with my clients. Um, I've been working on the armature. So this is mostly fabricated, not really cast. So just uh, components all together. My colored clay all laid out, getting ready to build a, the marinis I work on. And so what I'm doing with building this color is, uh, 
in the glass world, Melfiore and, 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 and Marini's are done sort of like a cane and it's done large and they put it in the furnace and they draw it out and then they'll come back and they'll cut those little pieces and they'll, could be flowers in the middle or we could just be concentric circles of color. Even Harvey Littleton's work that you guys might know a little bit about, he basically used that continuous layering of color and transition to make his big objects that were like the big standing loops that you would see that were formed in a similar way. So by doing that and then re-extruding them, putting them, compiling them together, you know, you're sort of creating this matrix. And that's cool at the end, but that's not what I'm after. What I'm after is that, the linear lines. I'm, I'm after that sort of, um, that, that beautiful sort of long line that has color transition. So these are some of my tests I did for that project. And they were a little darker, and, you know, just weren't, weren't quite right. And so here's what I wound up with. This is a piece that, this is the final piece. Are those stretched marinis? They're, they're uh, basically vivisected. Yeah, um, long ways. Yeah, long ways, long ways, linearly. And that's why you get this sort of sense of color and all these things jumping in there. And it's really, and uh, real quickly, I mean, one of the things that I loved about being a young potter, and part of the frustrating things about being a young potter was having uh, a system that you worked with, but you always had a, this element of chance. You never knew exactly what you were going to get out of the box when you opened that kiln a lot of times. And you tried to eliminate a lot of the loss that you had, but, but I grew to like that. I grew to like the fact that I get, would get surprised by, by that, that opening of the kiln. And, um, you know, I fire electric now, so, so it's not a surprise so much when I open the kiln, but I've, I've built in that sort of serendipity into the process, that sort of set the stage, I kind of plan a little bit for it, and then as I'm working, there's these things that happen that, that are inside of the tent of my control, but not really in my control. And, and, so, and what's great about that is there's a sense of discovery and fun to do it that way. Lower tip. This is called Old Man's Beard, which is after a native plant where I live. And there's another Old Man's Beard, but this is this is taking great liberties with the form, you know, with the, but it does follow the kind of the organic rules of that plant. Small piece sort of on the, using similar components. So I did, uh, this is uh, about three feet in diameter. It's kind of hard to read uh, that piece, but it's all bronze and glass. And um, it's um, called Black Medicine. And one of my favorite little pieces recently. This is uh, Dutch Solomon. So, um, I'm sort of, this is sort of the new work that's coming out of, and this is, these are little trays, and I've done this to create sort of tests so that um, I can move through some of the material quicker. This is my son, he was polishing those. I, they weren't out of the kiln when I left home. And, um, you know, there, there's a translucency to, to the material um, and an opacity. There's uh, uh, two different kinds of porcelain in it, that one's more translucent, one's more opaque. And then I'm adding color to um, to my to my material. And here's a little shot of um, LH project in uh, Joseph, Oregon. It's a lovely spot. It's at, in the Willamette um, Valley there. The Willamette Mountains are right to the back, uh, which are look the most alpine of any mountains I've seen in America, personally. And um, they live on a terminal um, on one of the moraines, a glacier moraine. Uh, there, just to the up the hill, and uh, what they've done is both of them are artists, um, um, Jacob Hess and, and Chris Antiman. Chris does sort of has been an artist in residence, and well, actually she's been an artist designer for Meissen for about five years, and she and I both sold at the same gallery for for you know for many years. 
and uh, and Jacob is a, a ceramic artist in his own right. And so what they've done is they've taken their place and turned it into a residency program as well as their own workplace. And so I was invited to go out for a month of this June, and my boys joined me about halfway in. And so this is the work that I did, which are, you know, it's, it's much simpler, but these are about 21 inches tall each, um, these platter forms. But it's sort of amplifying the kind of work I've been doing and, and play. And I, no, I'm not going to be going and making plates and saucers, but, but it's just for this form, it's just the right thing, just stripping it back. These are about probably 27, 27 inches, no, 28 inches. And these blue, blue and white, about the same, same size. And this is my little daughter's hands and my hands. And to give you a sense of my family, my wife Marjorie and Avery's 18 and taller than I am now. And Atticus has grown so much, he's taller than my wife Marjorie and our little daughter Ren. And it's been a good life. I've been able to do what I love. And, and uh, I've had busman holidays like this one all over the world, uh, where I go and work and vacation at the same time. And I want to thank you guys for coming out tonight and sharing a little bit of what I do. Yeah. three different materials that expand and contract in different ways. I mean, that's just the bottom line. And you can put some enamel on metal. I mean, we all know that you know enamel to metal happens. But in the way that I'm working, it's just not realistic to kind of do it that way. And um, what, what I've done is I've done enough testing that I know the shrinkage of, of my materials. So I've gotten to know my material. So when I make something out of glass, it has a punny on it, just like a bead punny. And I work off the end of it just like it was a pipe, uh, but I'm not blowing it. But when that bead release comes out, it leaves a reservoir that I can count on. So when I'm making the things that it sticks to, that stays fairly dimensional. Most of these things, clay, metal, glass, can all be ground to a certain extent. And occasionally I have to take dime into it and and go in and, and clean something out or do that kind of thing. But so there's a lot of prep work in, in, in putting a piece together. And I don't, didn't say much about that, but what's really wonderful about, um, you know, having all these components and preparing this piece for however long I'm working on it and just start to putting it together and see it kind of happen is, is a, it's a real, it's a personal gift to me because I love it. I mean, I love that process. I like being quiet in the studio and putting all these things together. And there is serendipity in it. I mean, the old man's beard, for instance, I did it, and, and as I started to build, I went, ah, I still have the right size here. You know, it's not the right size. Well, I stopped the next day and made more and got the right size. So I mean, I, and, and so I have the ability to, to make it work, and, and if it's not working, I've got that flexibility almost to the end. That's not always the way it is with the potter. You know, Potter makes it, fires it, and it's pretty much what it is. But there is, the way we're working in clay today, all bets are off. I mean, everybody's <laughs> doing anything and everything to clay. But, um, I mean, I, and I do think that um, the things that they all have in common is they all are plastic in one part of their nature. They're pliable, you can kind of move them around, you can sort of react to them. I like doing that. That's, that's I mean, I'm a, 
In fact, if you really want to get down to what I am, I'm a shape maker. I like to make shape. I get the best pleasure out of making shape and putting things together. I mean, that's a very simple. But and and when I see other people who bring things together in a way that just kind of gets me excited, um, I love it. I love it in other people and in what I see. And in the art that I love, for instance, I don't always like. I mean, I don't always just love the stuff that's like my work. I mean, there, there are people who do things that... I think being an artist is this thing of uh, conversation. It's, it's like somebody stirs me up, and, I, I, and music is an easy way to, to communicate that, I think. It's like someone does something that just kind of gets you. You just Every time you hear that song or every time you, you hear that music, it kind of connects somewhere. And boy, if you're a creative person, what do you want to do? You want to do something that has that similar impact. You want to just put the ball back over the net. And the, the simplicity for me about being an artist is I get stimulated by art. I want to be in the game, and I want to put the ball back in, in play. And that's that simple. I mean, and I, and I want to do the best work I can so that when I walk away, I feel like I've given my all. Because, I mean, the reality is, is that my work has gone away from me, and it, it goes different places. but. But if I've done my best at it, then I can kind of let it go and go, you know, just done my best and see where it goes. I don't know where it's going to go. But I keep that. I mean, that's a personal thing that I keep as long as I've got my awareness of what I've done. I mean, and, and I, uh, any of you that are being creative in your life, I mean, I mean, it's, it's not always about, you know, it's really about the, the experience that gets built into your life by being a maker, I think. I mean, that's the way I boil it down. Any other questions? Uh, I went up to the Tacoma, Seattle area last year to see the Dale Chiculi glass work up there. And I'm wondering, your biomorphic shapes, um, natural shapes, do you envision yourself doing the same thing going out of buildings and starting to make large landscape works that would actually be presented outside? Um, mm -hmm. Yes and no. I mean, I really, I, I, I mean, I had, I went on, <coughs> under the bridge almost every day yeah. when I was there as a resident, so it was kind of a nice experience. You know, people love to love, emulate, and hate Del Truly, but, <laughs> but, but, but Dale has uh, always said, you, you don't hate it too bad, because, I mean, he's busted a big hole for a bunch of us material-based artists to crawl through right after him. And I said, you know, the, he's made what we love and do more uh, approachable by the rest of the population in this this nation and in this world. I mean, I heard a survey a few years back that Dale's name was the, the most recognized living artist alive. Yeah, was wow. Dale yeah. and, and so he's done us all a service in that. And uh, as far as, you know, where it's going to take me, I, I have this fight between the intimate and the expansive, so I have no idea. I have a show hopefully coming up that will travel, so maybe it'll travel somewhere in this neck of the woods. But um, it's a good question because I wrestle with that somewhat. I mean, I'd like to take somebody inside the environment of things. You know, it's like that canopy. That canopy kind of speaks to. I'd love to be able to. Um, I think about it, being a kid laying on my back and looking up in the leaves and watching the moon and smelling the warm earth and all that kind of stuff. If I could give that to other people, that would be a cool thing. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for coming.